This is Dr. Julie Robiar. Dr. Robiar is an assistant professor with the Department of Medicine, uh, sorry, Department of Neurology, pardon me, and a scientist in the patient experience at BC Children's and Women's Hospital. She leads the research program at the intersection between dementia, ethics, and technology. So a very appropriate, I think, uh, dovetail talk to the talk that we heard earlier from Dr. Smalls about technology. And her research is aimed at evaluating the quality and the ethics of online health information and computerized tools for dementia screening and diagnosis. So, of course, a technology talk will require some change in technology right now, so it'll just be a second. And I invite Dr. Robiard to come up and speak to us. Can you hear me? Is this working? Excellent. Okay. So thank you for the opportunity to uh, come and tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing in technology. Uh, and I've entitled my talk, Technology Coming to a Clinical Trial Near You, but it already has, as we saw earlier this morning from Brienne, uh, we're already using pretty fancy technology to uh, do a whole range of research. So there's a number of ways in which technology can help as we research dementia. We can have help from technology for recruitment through things like online platforms, registries, or social media. We increasingly have technology-enabled tools for screening and diagnosis, and I'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. Sometimes technology can be the intervention itself. Uh, we can use assistive technology as uh, remembering aids, um, as Dr. Small mentioned earlier. Um, we're looking into robotics uh, moving forward and things like that. Technology can be used to measure the effectiveness of an intervention. So we can think, for example, of home-based sensor systems that will be able to uh, determine your emotional state and your cognitive state. Um, and finally, technology can be used for support through things like online support groups and online communities. Uh, so there's a lot of ways in which technology can help, um, but there's also a lot of issues um, that can be raised through technology. Privacy is a big concern with wearables. Uh, the quality of technology sometimes leaves something to be desired. So in my lab, we're very interested in issues around um, the, the benefits and the potential risks of technology. So in clinical trials, if you participate in research about dementia, here are some examples of technology you might encounter. You may be asked to wear something, a wearable like a watch that counts your steps or your activity or a headband uh, that you wear while you sleep, and this is to collect a whole range of physiological data. You may uh, encounter tools that are used for passive data collection, so instruments that are installed on your computers or your tablets or your phones uh, that just collect information about you. And we're getting a lot better at learning about individuals through things like how fast they type, uh, I'm part of a company that designs a, a little gizmo that tells uh, researchers where you're looking on a screen. And all these measures by themselves can be uh, not that informative, but when we group them together, we can know quite a bit about, uh, about someone's state, someone's cognitive abilities uh, through really simple metrics like that. We can have online platforms as part of clinical trials. These can be used, again, to connect with each other, with researchers, to provide feedback about your experience or to report uh, about side effects and things like that. Um, you can have home-based sensors, again, which will capture a whole range of information. Um, and you can have computerized assessments that you may do in the clinic. And some of you may have encountered uh, computerized assessments here at the UBC clinic. Um, and I'll discuss this um, in more depth. So in response to all these technologies and the new ones that are coming online, we're very interested in two things in the lab. We're interested primarily in evaluating them. So how good are they? Uh, what is it like to experience these technologies in the context of research? What is the ethics of these technologies? Um, and what is their impact? Do they actually help people or do they hinder the, the process in, in any way? And once we are done with the evaluation, we're taking all the data that we've learned and looking at how technology works and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. And then we use that to develop new technologies that we hope are better uh, through the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, to really make the technologies better and to make sure that they're more appropriate for an older adult demographic. 
So if you've attended the forum before, you have heard me speak already in 2016 and in 2017 about the quality of online resources about dementia. Um, and if you remember, you uh, might know that there's still some improvements that can be made on that front. Um, but I didn't want to reiterate some of that data. So today I'll tell you about a different study where we evaluated the experience of a technology, uh, in this case, computerized cognitive screening. So essentially a memory test done through a computer. And this is a study that was done by Janai Lai. Some of you may have met her. She's now a medical student at UBC. So for this study, we were interested in the experience of coming to the clinic and having a, a screening test for your cognitive abilities uh, using a program called the Cognigram. And the Cognigram is based entirely on uh, playing cards. So you sort and remember uh, a number of playing cards. And the whole thing is done through a computer. So we were really interested in what that was like for members of the patient community to come to the clinic and do this computer test and then go home. So we asked them about that. So we conducted an interview study, and what we did is we talked to individuals before they did the test to gather, uh, gather um, their expectations and their concerns and their hopes for the test. And then we also did a debrief session after the test where we asked about the experience, how it went for them, what they wish uh, had been done differently, and so on. We ended up talking to 19 participants as part of this study, um, and we conducted an analysis that we call thematic qualitative analysis, which essentially means we look at the themes in the data, we look at everything everyone told us, and what's similar across all of our participants, and what was different for different subsets of our participants. So I'm going to show you a little bit of data from this study. Uh, as I mentioned, we talked to 19 um, participants for this. We had a majority of women in the study. We had about half and half uh, participants who had university level education and, and did not. And we had about half and half of participants who had used computers at work. So we were very interested in sort of your baseline familiarity with computer because we felt that might impact how you felt about doing a computer test uh, in this context. And what's interesting is that for one participant, the Cognigram was their first contact with a computer. So here we're doing a study on individuals who use computers at work, even in the present day, every day, who are on their phones 24-7, just like me. Uh, and then we have, at the other end of the spectrum, a person for whom that was their very first contact with a computer. So I think that really highlights the challenges of developing technology for older adult populations, because we have such a big range of experience. So we uncovered a number of themes in the study, and I'm just going to share with you three uh, of the main themes today, um, because I only have 15 minutes, and I could probably talk about this for five hours. Um, but the first, uh, the first theme that really came up is that technology has a huge amount of potential uh, in, in terms of improving the efficacy of data collection, improves a, in terms of improving the accuracy of data collection. Uh, so there's a lot of ways in which technology can be beneficial. And to use the words of one of our participants, um, they told us, hopefully computers make everything faster, quicker, and better. And there was an underlying theme there that if technology could just be quicker and better at doing all the boring stuff, then we'd have more time to actually talk with the, with the physician. So that was sort of the, the take-home message from, uh, from the potential of technology. Is let's, technolo let's do everything we can to get the boring stuff out of the way so that we can have more one-on-one -on -one time with uh, healthcare professionals. Not surprisingly, we also heard a lot of participants tell us about the need for human contact. And I think that really tells us that we need to pay attention at when we use technology and when is a good time to use technology. Uh, the Cognigram was done uh, at a period where there's still some uncertainty about diagnosis. Um, and so there was a lot of anxiety and so on. And we have one participant who really illustrated this well uh, when they said, when you're stressed out and you think you're about to lose your mind, it helps to have a person there asking the questions. And so that really is a very good way to explain a very difficult concept, which is that we need to use technology as a complement to the care that we deliver, not as a replacement to the care that we deliver. And the last thing I want to mention um, is sort of the emotional uh, implications of using technology in a clinical setting. So through the transcripts of the interviews that we did, we were able to uncover a lot of characteristics about the test. So here are some things that we heard. The test is new and scary. Uh, some people felt the test was too intense. Some people felt the test was boring. So we have sort of those two ends of that spectrum. Uh, we had a number of, uh, of participants who told us the test did not reflect their ability. Uh, they worried that they might have been trigger happy because they were a little nervous that day and that really their memory or their cognition was better uh, than what their results might show. 
And then we also had a range of participants tell us that the test utility was unclear. So they were not 100% convinced that the test could actually do uh, what it is that it said it would do. Uh, and that's a problem. And as a technology designer, we always have to keep that in mind. If you want people to use the thing that you're, the, the gizmo that you're making, uh, it needs to be clear what the gizmo is for. So definitely some room for improvement. In terms of the emotions associated with these characteristics of the test, participants told us as a result of, for example, the test being too intense, they were unable to concentrate. At times, they were feeling lost, feeling bombarded. Uh, we heard a lot of things about anxiety. Inherently, it's a test, right? So we always worry about test taking. And then we heard a lot of self-blame. So we had participants who said, you know, I should have done better. You know, I didn't bring my A game on today. I should have done better or I should have prepared more, uh, which is not actually something that you can prepare for. So we don't expect people to prepare for tests like this. Um, so that's an issue. So when we looked at this package of, of information, and I want to highlight that we also had a lot of positive feedback about the test. Now, sort of, uh, you know, mentioning a lot of negative uh, things today as sort of a, a way to highlight how we need to move forward and do better. Um, but there were a lot of benefits to this test, but there are also some issues that we need to take in mind. We don't want people coming, uh, experiencing interventions, whether in the clinic or at home, and then feeling uh, anxiety or self-blame as a result. That's not where we want to go. So we need to do better. So how do we move forward with that? Knowing what we know about using technology, knowing about the good technologies out there and the not so good technologies, how do we move forward to ensure that we can improve recruitment, that we can improve efficiency and accuracy um, in the dementia research that we're doing, but that we also challenge the issues of adoption, so making sure that people want to use the technology, uh, challenges of ethics and challenges around the potential harms like emotional uh, anxiety that can result uh, as a, after using technology. So in the lab, uh, we have two potential solutions to this. I've alluded a little bit um, earlier on that we're looking into artificial intelligence, and this is so one way that we hope we can design better technology um, is by making sure that it's better aligned with the end user's emotion. Um, so this is just a title from a publication I recently uh, worked on with a colleague out of Waterloo, where we're proposing that technologies for people with dementia and older adults uh, more broadly need to include a mechanism to understand human emotion. So if you're feeling anxious that day, we need the technology to be able to recognize that and do something about it so you don't leave the room feeling like you did a poor job or feeling down or feeling like it was your fault. So we're proposing to do this through identity modeling, which is sort of essentially putting numbers on people's identities and emotions, and it works pretty well, um, even though it may seem a little bit out there, but it's early days of integrating this in technology that people actually use. So one of the first application areas uh, we're looking into for this technology is Alba. You may have met her if you were here last year. Uh, so this is a virtual assistant that we're developing who is going to help you safely navigate online resources. So online, there's a lot of information about dementia, and not all of it is good. I've already covered this. Um, so what we want to do is we want to essentially help people find the good information, use the good information, and forget about the magical cures uh, that you may um, be purchased for $100 a month every month forever. Uh, so we're trying to avoid the, the, those kinds of, uh, you know, encountering that kind of advice, and we're doing that through a virtual um, uh, assistant. It was a browser plugin, and we're combining a lot of different technologies into her. Uh, her name is Alba. Um, we're tr trying to automate the assessment of the quality of online health information so that Alba immediately knows if you're on a good quality web page or a bad quality web page. We're trying to integrate this emotional and identity modeling so that she knows you and she knows what you need that day and how you need it to be delivered for you to really understand uh, what she's trying to tell you. And then we're doing this whole um, technology development process using end user feedback. So hearing from you about what would work for you and what would not work for you. What are your main concerns in terms of ethics for something like that? Uh, so we're using that uh, tools to, to do user engagement around that. We also want to help other technology developers in doing a good job. Uh, and so in order to do that, we've uh, put forward a framework, again, that was recently published, where we are trying to guide technology development for applications in dementia specifically, and we're trying to get technology developers to follow five sort of golden uh, areas of, uh, of uh, focus, if you would like. Uh, the first one is to use an inclusive participatory design. So again, to make sure that people with dementia, caregivers, healthy older adults are all included in the process of technology development. 
to make sure that there's emotional alignment. So as I mentioned, to make sure that these technologies recognize that humans have emotions and you can't just deliver the same thing to everybody. Uh, that's not usually going to work. Uh, we're trying to encourage technology developers to use ad adoption modeling, and this is work out of colleagues in Northern Ireland that have uh, really interesting models that predict whether someone is going to adopt a technology or not, and we can use that when we develop technology to make sure that it's uh, broadly applicable. We are pushing for standards assessment, and this is ethical standards assessment, so we want to make sure technology developers have good informed consent procedures, that they adhere to the strictest privacy rules. So all of that is uh, incorporated in the standards assessment. And then we're also encouraging technology developers to uh, focus on training and education. If you don't understand or don't know how to use the technology, you're not probably not going to do it. I mean, there's uh, certain things in my own home that I still don't touch because I, I just can't be bothered to learn. Uh, so we're trying to emphasize that training and education is needed, or you can design your technology in a way that is so intuitive that training is not needed. So those are your sort of two options. Um, so we're working forward with this uh, framework. We're trying to evaluate um, whether technology developed with this framework is going to lead to better outcomes uh, than technology design without it. Uh, and so far, it's looking quite good. And with that, I'd like to thank, uh, first and foremost, ex uh, I want to extend my sincere thanks to our research participants who uh, participated in the Cognigram study uh, with us. It was so valuable for us to hear from you and to uh, gather this very valuable information about cognitive screening tools. And I can tell you that I've already uh, provided that feedback to the company uh, that designs the tool, and they already modified it um, according to the feedback that we provided. So this is very important uh, for us to learn about, about uh, the products in that way. And so I'm very grateful to the research participants, also to the funding bodies, uh, the trainees who do all the work, and uh, collaborators from around the world. Thank you.